informal. Um, prior to go COVID, I actually used to run these uh, uh, once a month. Um, they're kind of an opportunity to connect with the community. Um, there are always things that we're working on. Um, there are things that come up that we're having problems with as well. And it's just, it's a good forum to just have some conversations, to generate some ideas, um, to get from the community what they need, depending upon what's going on in and around the school district. Uh, there will be times, as I run these open forums, will be monthly, um, typically around budget season, that there will be presentations and whatnot to try to educate people on, you know, this, this is the budget for next year, this is what people's taxes can expect to be. If we're changing things, these are the reasons why and, and what we're attempting to accomplish with it tonight. So, a couple of fo focuses for tonight. Um, the first one um, has to do with some of the curriculum work that is happening this year. And we've got a group that is trying to define what life skills are for students. And life skills are the things that everybody needs to be able to do just to be able to conduct the basic activities of life when they're outside of school. And so, you know, we do a pretty good job. We teach the ELA, we teach the math, and we teach the science. But there's a lot of basic life skills that we don't touch on. Um, there are a lot that, that, that in a lot of cases should be happening in the home, sometimes don't. And if we want to make sure that our students are really prepared when they walk out into the world, we want to identify what they are so we can create a program here to make sure that they're getting what they might have been missing for the past couple. So that'll be the, the, the first topic um, of conversation. Um, the second topic uh, is talk a little bit about uh, door security and uh, the, the idea of the one door system and what's good and bad about it and pros and cons to get some feedback from the folks that are here tonight on yes, it's a good idea, no, we think it's a little bit too restrictive so that I can take that information back to the cabinet um, and we can use that in kind of our deliberations as we're really trying to make sure the schools are as safe as they can be while not being too much for, for people to bear. Um, there are a couple other things that we should also touch on. We've had some discussion about the safety of this little side road here um, by the side of the school. Uh, in addition, I had a couple others. Uh, we had a, a discussion way back at when I started my tenure about the possibility of a resource officer. Um, I wanted to throw that out there, get a feel um, for what people's initial kind of gut reactions were to that. And then maybe a bigger discussion um, about the possibility of replacing this building in the RTCC complex. Um, there are some things that are happening in Vermont broadly that are coming together in a good way that might make it possible with the state contributing a significant amount of funding towards that endeavor. And so we can talk a little bit about the possibilities tonight, but again, it's a first conversation. It's okay, what, people check your guts, tell, tell me, do you, think, do you think this is something that we wanna take on or, or not um, to help you with that guidance. Um, I will also hang out. It's, it is an open forum after we get through the, the more guided discussions, and then it's just open to anything anybody wants to talk about. So, got a lot of people. Um, I'm wondering if it's easier if we should go around and introduce each other or if it's easier just to introduce yourself when, when you talk. What do you think? <laughs> introduce when they talk, as we talk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the big thing is just, just to who you are. Hey, I'm, you know, I'm Lane Millington. I'm, I'm superintendent for the district. So let's, let's start off with this um, idea of life skills. Um, We've had uh, a focus group that met on one of the professional development days about two weeks ago that generated a pretty good list. This is a focus group. You're going to give me some ideas. Some of those ideas may be exactly the same as they came up with, and that's actually good. Because I'm also going to run a focus uh, group with the students. Um, we did have teachers at the original focus group, so we've got some input there. And then we can start to take uh, a look at what's common to what came up from those three groups, because those are probably the things that we should prioritize. And so there, there is a plan here. Yep. So I just, I'm going to get David and Tori, Jason. So when we were in school here, we had a class called On Your Own. That name oh, has come up a bunch of times. <laughs> so I don't know if, I mean, you got it. Mrs. Miling used to teach it. <laughs> it, was, it was, so it was a class that every student had to take before they graduated. Yep. And it literally was a checkbook you guys can help yeah. me remember. But it was Actually, check, this is good because I want to know the skills. It was cooking, checkbook. Mm -hmm. We even had to sew something. Mm 
That's mm-hmm. fine. Pillowcase. Um, <laughs> it, 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 literally, that's what it was. It literally was. We even had the baby. I remember I had, had to carry my flower sack around. I know. I think that's in health now, but like Sophia was talking about it. But there was something called, and I don't know when we when that stopped. You know, I mean, I'm we, dating. We my talked s- about it. It sounded. When did you graduate? It sounded like it was I, a while. I graduated in '98. Yeah, so it, it sounded like when we were checking on it, it was about 12 years ago that it stopped. Okay. I don't know why. I, I've been here five. Um, but that that exact class, the name of that has come up um, in a bunch of the And there was groups. also, I mean, we still have them, but like you wrote a letter to yourself in that class that was sent back to you like 10 or 15 years. We still, my husband and I still have ours. Like it was really neat. Like they, they just did some really creative things, but a lot of it was just some basic skills on what to do on everyday things. And so are the, the plan is we're, we're reaching out to Deb Larry, um, who, who is here, who we believe may have some sort of document that kind of outlines what the course was. So it's, it's a good one. So it's good stuff. Other, um, other thoughts and ideas, life skills. Things that, that, that kids will need when they get out of school that's not specifically taught in school or specifically taught at home that they need just to be able to get through their lives. I think some of it's conflict. Yeah. Knowing how to deal with conflict. Yeah. And even just how to navigate that. Like if someone says something to you, right, how do you respond back? And how do you respond back without anger? Mm-hmm. How do you respond back with a little evidence-based? Or how do you respond back in a positive manner of saying, I'm really mad at you right now, but I don't know how to say something, but how can we touch base with this later? Or you know, just because I'm mad at you doesn't mean I hate you, right? Like, so how, how, do, we, how do we have those conversations? Because I think a lot of us, even as adults, don't know how to do mm-hmm. that still, right? Or it's a constant work in progress. Yeah, that's good. Other ideas? Well, a question. So um, my Ben uh, Brookfield, I have a daughter who graduated from RUHS, I have a son currently attending. Um, the life skills would be, um, a requirement for everybody who goes through RUHS to okay. Yeah, the, the four, how how we deliver it will decide later. It may be standalone classes. It may be embedded in current classes. It'll probably be a combination of the two. And some of the things that people are bringing up are already embedded and happening. So it's just making sure that people are aware. Yeah. Right, and we can see it being beneficial. That this is my opinion that it definitely should be applicable to all, and but that it's not a static thing that it could morph. Um, you know, over a period of time, uh, you know, however things, you know, could be uh, one or two years behind the eight ball, but still a good thing to have, you know, if you're learning how to uh, fix a carburetor on a, on a gasoline-powered vehicle, yeah, maybe that's five years out of date, but, you know, maybe, uh, you know what I mean, like, uh, it needs to be able to have some element to have change made. By change as the, as the world changes around it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is good ideas. <laughs> yep. How to handle a credit card? Don't get one. Well, they're debit gone. Card. <laughs> debit card. I know it's uh, true. You can say that, but right. but then well. also, what is a credit card? Is, what is, is a credit card? They give them debit. For, is it a know, bank? They give them out at colleges. Um, they're, 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 they want them. Yeah, yeah well, they, not only to give them out at the colleges, they well, they should line with the college. They, mm-hmm. That was how. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I have my own opinions about credit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'm just sure. Oh, that's good. So, I, so the, the idea, the idea of, of, of how, how to handle a credit card and, and what is credit, you know, credit score, things that you have to maintain to be able to yeah, navigate your way through that. Well, and also maybe what it's not. So just, just introducing uh, having a credit card as a life skill, I wouldn't want to see that without um, um, an asterisk underneath it that, that's saying, well, maybe working for the bank for the rest of your life might not be your... Your, your, your goal. Um, and if you don't have really strong ideas of what you want and how you want to get it, you might be in the, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of people who have a lot of debt. Mm-hmm. And so they're working for the bank. Mm-hmm. And that's great if you want to be a, a banker. So fi- financial planning, how to save, how to plan. Yeah, how something along those lines. Not, not just sort of how to use our mm-hmm. And what happens when you go into debt? Like what you know, actually, actually, 
not just teaching them how to use a K brand setter, by the way. Maneuver um, out of it. Yeah, exactly. How how do you how do you budget? What does debt look like? What can it you right. know, that sort of thing. The only reason I'm being quiet is because I'm keeping up on the good ideas. I have another one too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cooking nutrition, like mm -hmm. for for nutritional value. Um, not just cooking, because I think when we had on your own, it was like cookies. And, you know, you learned how to use the stove, but it wasn't, there was no nutritional value in it. So being able to cook a balanced meal. Gotcha. I think the cooking part and nutrition should include the grocery shopping. Right? Surprised. Here's your budget. Here's what you need. <laughs> how to care for produce. <laughs> yes. Or maybe even how the, how the grocery stores will lay out products that are very convenient and you need to dig a little deeper if you want to save money and find that nutrition. And, just, and that's time management skill there, too. Uh, I think navigating social media would be a very good starting early. Because, you know, it's parent choice when your child has access to these things, right? And so, but then I don't think children really understand or parents understand what it means, what it really means to post things. And like, so it would just be a really good idea to under, have an under, a global understanding of what it means. Yeah, we've, we've got a, the librarians are pulling together to create a full li digital literacy K-12 program. Oh, that's So yeah, that's, that's a piece that's in there, but it's an important one. Yeah. yeah. I think technology literacy is really important and, and there's a difference between like information literacy around how do I assess and know the information I'm looking at and there's a difference between say social media content and what's happening to you when you're looking at that and understanding the technology that you're not living with today but we're living with tomorrow so what does it mean when we talk about things like virtual reality. What does it really mean? I mean, what is that going to look like and what kind of conversations are our students having and our faculty having around how does this change the way we show up with each other? We're already seeing what social media does to us. So what happens when we're in a, where we're all sitting in this room virtually while we're sitting in our beds with our goggles on having this conversation with our avatars? What's that going to look like? How's that going to affect, you know, the way we live. So how does technology impact our society and who we are and what we care about? Um, and how's that going to influence the way we show up? And the skill sets that we're going to need in two years or five years. Right? That's big stuff. Adaptability, resiliency, decision making, all of those things are tied into it as well. Accountability. Accountability, yeah, accountability responsibility that yeah. as well. And this is uh, this first topic I want to I want to exhaust with folks because it's it's an important one. Well, I, I never don't lose your thought. Keep, keep your hand up. I'm assuming based on the conversation that people feel this is important for us to be working on as a district. So um, I do. I'd like to say something. My name is Kate Van Houten. I'm a teacher. Don't lose your oh, is there somebody ahead of me? Nope. Go for it. <laughs> she ahead of me. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, Something students aren't currently taught is how to email appropriately. Be, be, be a little more. Um, I think they language think or email and text are the same, and I think it's an effective skill to learn how to email and when to email. Like and etiquette. So you're looking yeah, at like like email etiquette. etiquette. Yeah. Like you need a subject and right. like undress the person. Yeah. And like That's a good point. Make demands. Yeah. 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 Punctuation. I, yeah, as a teacher, I get a lot of emails, which is great. Please communicate with me. This is like modern communication, but like this is not how we do this. Well, how about understanding what a correspondence copy is and what yes. a BCC is? Oh, so no, that's, that's the right. way. Yeah, right. yeah. That's right. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's actually good. Yeah, so I'm a teacher at the elementary school across the street, and I'm a parent of an 8th grader and a 10th grader who was transferred out. Um, my 10th grader did a lot of homeschool with us, with COVID and just uh, homeschooling before that. So I think these are great ideas. I absolutely think it's something the district needs to think about. It's a great conversation. I just think um, on a case-by-case -case basis, perhaps having some kids be have an option to opt out. 
I feel like I'm a really proactive parent and all these things, I'm kind of like, check, 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 which I'm not trying to like say, you know, wow, but we have a lot of conversations about these things all the time, and thinking about my 10th grader wanting um, where he is now, filling his schedule with, with classes that are really college preparatory. Um, so just maybe an opt-out option on a case-by-case -case that was looked at really carefully. I agree with you. I think a lot of people would benefit. What we're talking about, we are doing some of the same things, right? Right. So, yeah. There, there, there are parents who a lot of this stuff is covered at home. There, Absolutely. There are, there are a lot that are not, and we just want to, if we can fill in the gap. Well, if, if you, see, I'll, I'll respectfully disagree. I believe if you allow an opt-out, you'll see the evaporation of the program It'll disappear like it did in 2007. Whereas if you just say this is mandatory, those kids who are college-bound or more, I don't know, um, uh, experienced it at home knowing how to email and things like that, uh, maybe there's some advanced things that they can learn, like, Take it where, to did a different B, level. where did BCC yeah. come from? You know, why are we doing that in an email? Let me, you know, it, 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 maybe they learn more about uh, I don't know the transition from typewritten letters to uh, you know I appreciate something that. like that, that auto correction. Elevated. You know, think, yeah, an elevated mm -hmm. thing, but within the same thing because mm -hmm. if you do that, my kids aren't going to want to take those classes. Not just that simple. And yet, I feel that they should have those life skills. They might not realize they need those life skills because they're college bound. So what I can do is I've got, I've got both ideas down, um, and that's kind of a future sort of discussion to say, yeah, should, should we, should we not, which is a rich one. I think it's important to have, right. but we're, we're kind of just in idea generating mode. Um, mm -hmm. To get as much on the table, good, bad, ugly, mm -hmm. as, as we can to kind of sort through. So. Can I add one thing? Yeah. Um, in terms of financial literacy, I think insurance is really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's renter's insurance or like dorm insurance when you go to college, how to access insurance for your car, mm -hmm. um, health insurance, how to navigate those systems. I think it's just really important. I, I want to second the health piece. It's like, how do you talk to your doctor? when? Because like this magic thing happens when a child hits 18. And suddenly the doctor won't talk to the parent anymore, and you have to go through a process. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and it, it's like a switch. Mm -hmm. And so, helping our young people get ready to advocate for their own health needs, I think that'd be powerful. So, David, so yeah. healthcare obviously is a really good one. Um, just basic car care, like changing a tire, battery. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yes, air in the tire. Yeah. How to behave when a light comes on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is, what is on? Yeah. Continue to run it to death. Right. Um, I was gonna. I was gonna offer like mock interviews. Um, you know, providing scripts, cold calls, um, and I think like uh, interviews for like a job process. Yeah, yeah. job or school or whatever. Um, and I think also, like, we talk a lot about time management, but we talk a lot about that as it applies to, like, homework and, like, you know, balancing, like, if you're doing co-curriculars plus homework. But I don't think we talk a lot about it in, like, a post-secondary setting. So, like, time management, if you're balancing courses plus work plus, you know, fitness, like, how do you manage your time when you really design it, what that looks like? Gotcha. I have a, another one. <laughs> Talking to adults. How to talk to adults in a in a non-family setting to for the ones who are college bound so that they're not afraid to go talk to their professors and not ask, you're not afraid to ask for help from, you know, how to advocate for yourself in those situations and talk with adults. But then even in the job interview process or um, any other situation where you would need to talk to someone who's older than you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and have the build the confidence skills to know that you know what you say matters and you can do it and it's the one-on-ones it's not the group things I think it's like that literal like one-on-one -on -one stranger thing <coughs> let's make sure I got the details good I think interacting with law enforcement. I think a lot of children, I mean, I graduated 2009, probably was the youngest one here. 
I, I was still raised, whether right or wrong, to have a certain level of respect and tone. Whether I was in the right or he was in the wrong, whatever. But I mean, I've seen young people have some really bad interactions, just right off the, right off the start. Like, you could get pulled over for your, your state inspection sticker and you are automatically want to fight the guy. It's like, he's just, at that point, he's probably just doing his job. So you, you could escalate a situation that's just, hey, your sticker's expired, can you take care of that? To probably get a ticket if you're in a fight with the guy. So I, I just don't think, you know, if the parents aren't doing it or whatever, at least we could, like, same thing with, like, interviews and dealing with, with adults, you're dealing with, you know, law enforcement. I can, I can put in if it's okay along with that, it's just de-escalation in general. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which would go into the conflict management, mm -hmm. perhaps even the listening and your ability to interact one-on-one -on -one with a, with a quote-unquote adult. Um, <laughs> where I'm going with that is sometimes you're, you know, you're, you know as a child that, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you, how, how, how are you respectful? Are you listening? Are you trying to understand what that person is saying? And that could also de-escalate it, in my experience. Ideas are slowing down a little bit, but what else would happen? Other, <laughs> I'm not going to use this. Yeah, just well, fun. this is sort of the water I've been swimming in um, for a number of years. So Jason Finley, um, last nine years at Randolph Technical Career Center and Career Services. Um, an opportunity came up this year to work here at the Middle School and High School. Um, in the Innovation Center, co-teaching in there. Um, but also working, um, hopefully, to try to integrate uh, career education across 7 through 12 in different ways, shapes, and forms, from how do you write a professional email, and how do you pick up a phone and make a phone call. Um, if a guest speaker comes in, how do you walk up? Actually, my classes that I taught over there, you got to practice shaking hands. It's like, oh my gosh, look me in the eye and introduce yourself. Um, so when a guest speaker comes in, how are you properly prepared to address them and ask, do your research and ask good questions and have a conversation with people um, that you might not know and um, be engaged and not just try to look at your phone underneath the tabletop while they're trying to you know, present their ideas while there's college that they're you know, trying to sh share um, opportunities at or employer. Um, so these are a lot of things that I do. It's sort of the water I swim in. Um, is, these ways that not only give you the skills to navigate to college or career, but just with other individuals as well, right? Um, I think that's really important. Um, really, I think my job I share is how to help students make good decisions about college and career pathways mm -hmm. once they leave here. Um, that is, to me, a life skill. Because I see often I hear students come back and say, oh, I should listen to you, Mr. Finlay. We went off and did this or that. and um, had I spent a little bit more time just being more aware of the options that were out there, um, I would have gotten to where I wanted to be sooner or not end up with this burden of debt and no way to pay for it because I dropped out of this program. And now I'm going back and going to like the seven year plan for college. <laughs> um, so I think part of those life skills, uh, which also ties into personal finance because you're not taking out unnecessary student loans if you don't have to, if you're trying to get done in four years because you know exactly why you're there. Um, and you've had some work experiences and talked to people about those opportunities and that specific degree program or apprenticeship or certificate program that might relate to what your future aspirations are. Um, so I think with life skills too is sort of figuring out like, who you are as an individual um, and kind of thinking about the lifestyle you want once you leave school and what kind of career pathways fit into that lifestyle. So yeah, that's, that's the water I swim in. <laughs> Actually, there are quite a few pieces I didn't pull out, which is which was really excellent. Let's try, to, let's try to get two more before we. Um, my name is Marcia Mathis, and I'm the parent of O1. Um, I would add appropriate dress uh, for some kids that, like, what do you mean appropriate? This is appropriate. And it could be, depending on where you're going. But I would certainly not assume that all households and all kids know what, what that means. Um, the other thing, I don't know what you call this, but there are, you know, having some knowledge of current events. I don't know how, whether you agree with it or not, but just having some knowledge 
of current events. And I don't know what the current events would be, but. Um, well, that would fit in, uh, sorry, that would fit in nicely with the digital literacy, whoever brought that up, mm -hmm. right? Knowing where, you know, knowing from whom and where you're choosing to garner your information. That is a huge part of yeah. what we're developing. Or, or oh, not, because you're also making a choice not to yep. not to pay attention to certain things. Yeah. Reliable that, resources. Yep. Right. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> one more. Let's see if we can squeeze one more out. Well, I hate to say it. I'm Elaine, by the way. I never introduced myself. Um, and this is just an issue that we've run into at the college level. Hygiene. Mm. I, 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 you know, that I feel that's a, a, a home <laughs> thing and that should not be a school thing, but the amount of young people who come into first year college yes. who like, oh my God, you need, you actually have to ask, ask them to leave your class is uh, way too many. And, and so I, I hate to put that out there, but I'll throw that out there for you all to think about. <laughs> I'll second it. Yeah. Oh, including <laughs> sleep hygiene. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm assuming that, or let me ask it this way, will we tailor life skills for the, the student? By that I mean if, if the student is on a spectrum, um, then a lot of all that stuff needs to be tailored. Um, I guess maybe if you could just make that note. John, it's actually it's a good point. It's a little further down the process. Okay. That differentiation. But well, if you do tailor it, uh, try to make it feel as unsegregated as possible. Because uh, mm -hmm. you know whether whether there's a good reason for you to be there or not. If you perceive it as you know a certain mm -hmm. isolated, and you don't identify with that, you're you're, you're not going to go. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe send a questionnaire <coughs> home. You know, have parents and child sit down and say, hey, what's the thing that you think you want to work on and what's the things that maybe mom and dad think that you could work on and provide that to the school and yeah. right. in that course we look and see if we hit those marks yeah. or we, you know, maybe spend less time in automotive because he's mechanically inclined but maybe a little bit more on the home ec side because he has no idea how to start the laundry machine. Right. <laughs> so, he's, you know, he still is involved with the kids who are doing automotive stuff but he's getting special attention with, you know, more of the home ex side. Let the family kind of think, oh yeah, you know what, that's a good idea. Maybe you do need that, maybe you do need to learn that. Or pairing up with a peer, right? So someone who is better at one of those things, they can, oh, someone sure. who knows how to right. change a tire can help the other one who knows does nothing how to cook, right? Sure. So then you're establishing relationships with your peers. Is there still a community service component here? So, the, yeah, and that was, um, that actually came up in the last focus group, too, is, is, is that a life skill? We weren't sure if it was, but it seemed like an important piece. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll make sure we put that down again. Becoming part of the community. I don't know where, um, how you undo what from birth to 18 has done. I don't even know, but there's got to be some way to reprogram um, if that has been really not helpful. I, I think as we're kind of been reading, going back and kind of looking at the idea of, of good student citizens and discipline and what's good discipline, a lot of it rests on the fact that the students just haven't really been trained in the proper ways to behave. Mm. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it, it, I think it's a rare occurrence that they were trained purposely the wrong way is that they just weren't trained at all. Mm. And so that's why these discussions are so important, right? Kid, kid walks into the classroom, you know, bops the friend on the back of the head, sits down, makes some noise. The retraining of that's really easy. Hey, after school you're coming in five times, you're gonna walk in the class quietly, you're gonna sit down, mm -hmm. get your books books ready, and, and, and be ready to roll. And, and it's just that simple retraining sometimes. But it's a very good point. Um, all right, how are we feeling? Good. We exhausted this or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does the high school have a dress code? They do now. We do. You yeah. do? 
They, they had one before, it's a little bit more strict. Just thinking about preparing the kids mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. to dress properly so yes. when they go out to go interview for a job, yeah. they're not in their PJs. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, they're, they don't wear PJs now, do they? Oh. Not, not generally, no. Um, <laughs> so there are, there are a lot of changes since You can talk one. about the change, yeah. change yeah. 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 We aligned our dress code with the tech center dress code, so it's really focused on being prepared um, for either college or career. Um, and so the conversations that we've been having with students this school year about dress and attire because it is a reset for many of them um, and we tried to send home in the middle of the summer a newsletter and explain what the dress code would be because um, we had a conversation with a freshman last week and she was like I worked all summer and I bought these clothes oh. and it, it was you know frustrating for her that they're just not really professional attire. Um, and so I understand that frustration, but at the same time, if we're preparing kids for life beyond high school, mm -hmm. I think um, another skill that's built into a lot of our classes that's a life skill is like collaboration. How do you work with people mm -hmm. and also dress for the, the role that you're in? Yeah, um, we were very specific about making sure that that like provision of the policy was like context matters. So you might wear your PJs to bed, but you don't wear your PJs to school. Yeah. It's evening wear, you wear it in the, it's <laughs> underwear, you wear it under things. It's beach wear, you wear it at school. If there is a PJ yeah. day at school, then you wear your PJs. Yes. 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 You For spirit week, enjoy yeah. the PJs. So let's um, school appropriate. Good, good, good stuff. And I appreciate the sense of humor. It's, it always makes it, it, it fun. Um, we'll switch switch gears a little bit. Talk about kind of the one door policy, um, because there, there's, like I said, there's when you're creating a safety plan, you want to make things as safe as you can, but you also want to make things tolerable. And one of the things about where when you're hardening a, a building, when you're increasing safety in a building, the thing. Um, that pays the price is usually convenience. And so a part of this discussion with the community is, okay, where is that balance point? You know, what are, what are we able or, and willing to give up a little bit in terms of, of safety for what are exceedingly rare events um, in order to have a little bit more inconvenience or are we not willing to give anything up? So current standard protocols um, that have been in place across the nation, across districts for quite a while now, is the idea that when school is in session, so in other words, right, if the first class starts at 7.30, that's when school is in session. If the last class ends at 2.30, that's when school ends. During that time, you're in what's called a soft lockdown. All entrances around the building are locked, um, except for usually the main entrance of the school where people have to buzz in so that there is somebody physically monitoring and, and seeing who was at the door before they let them in. Um, and that's kind of the standard <coughs> protocol. But Again, there's this inconvenience factor that comes with it, and, and some of those inconveniences can be pretty significant. If we've got over at the elementary school, if we've got the preschoolers out who don't have good bladder and bowel control, um, and may not be able to wait the five minutes to walk around the building to get buzzed in the front door if they're out at recess or they're, they're out doing a class activity, um, that can lead to problems. Um, in the case of uh, PE, you know, do they need to lose, you know, 10 minutes of class time walking around from the, the front of the building um, all the way back out to the athletic fields and another, you know, 10 minutes to walk back around to the front of the building at the end of the class. So there, again, it's this idea that there's, there's trade-offs here. Um, the other piece that's an, an expectation is that the classroom doors are locked and closed um, during the day. Um, we have some procedures and protocols that um, you know people have gotten a little lax on that we're trying to trying to crack down on, um, but we have some other systems in in place to kind of help out, which I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, but general feelings, and it's good we've got got a couple of teachers here as well um, on you know in the terms of this balance between safety and convenience, where do we want to land? And I'll open it up. This might be kind of controversial, so it'll be good for us to practice our de-escalation skills. <laughs> What do, we, what do we think? So you were talking about one door in. So 
what so you the, are proposing is one door. That, and that's the school is pretty it. much what's been in place with some exceptions, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thing, and we, we bought all the hardware um, uh, probably about four years ago. We did a whole revamp of, of everything um, and really kind of hardened the districts, upgraded the door hardware, updated the cameras, made sure that we had the buzzers to buzz people in at those front doors. Now, at Brookfield Elementary School, uh, it, uh, on several occasions, it averted some genuine problems, in my memory. Um, the one door policy? Yeah. Or at least having a. Yeah, having, having doors that could easily walk, going towards that one door policy. So, um, <clears throat> so that's anecdotal, that's personal experience, and that's, to me, recent history. Does that mean that? You know, it happens once in your recent history, meaning that it's going to continue happening. And to what degree is that? Because it is an inconvenience. I didn't thought, I hadn't thought about ladder control. Although the older I get, the more I do think I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, it, 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 you know, it goes full circle, right? Yeah. You know. So. Um, I guess I remember Brookfield um, always having one door. Well, it's just the, the side and then it's up in the back, too, I think, well, right? Well, that one my was there. Yeah. Uh, I just remember that always you went through the front door of us. Well, we've got... Yeah. One of the one of the, the pieces here to, to try to add some context as I'm listening to people talking is this this idea of the teachers being able to go in and out of those doors and not having to go around. Mm -hmm. It's convenient, um, right? Because sometimes they can go directly out to where the activity is or where the um, where the playground is. Um, but there are problems with it. We have an electronic system um, where it's kind of like you know hotel doors, right? You flash the card, the door opens up. If I've got teachers that have those cards turned on so they can come in and out during that school day when kids are here, and I get a shooter who has done their planning, and most of them do, they have now have access to grab somebody's key card off the, the playground or wherever the teacher is and use it to get access to any door. And so there's a, there's a con to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a, a, an emergency system. There are a couple of buttons in and around the building that people can press. Uh, when that happens, everybody's key card is shut off and can't be used. But if you don't know that somebody's gotten a key card and gotten to the building until they're already in there, the damage is done. So again, talk about the cons and the pros. Would there be a way of trial this? So say you want to trial the whole one-door policy. You trialed it for we, we've six been, months. We've or? been doing it. We've made a, a couple of exceptions um, with some caveats right now. Like uh, for the teachers, uh, for your PE teachers, and, and, and for the, the preschool and the kindergarten teachers, it's okay. We're going to give you access um, to come in and out those doors because of the, the, the issues that are associated with, with, with what you're teaching. But you are signing this form that says you understand that there's a process in place. When you go out that door, you are the last one that goes out the door. You pull it tight and you mm -hmm. actually tug on it to make sure that it's locked. And if you fail in that, that duty, we're going to take it pretty seriously. So how would it work with sports? So like sports teams, you know, multiple practices, multiple times. How would it so in the with? so after the regular school day, that two thirty, um, we are a public building again. We're wide open. Yeah. So it's usually it's usually the the model is it's usually when just when kids are in session when they're in their classes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will say that I am very much for having doors locked. Um, I think that 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 just makes the most sense to me um, and as a teacher and the struggle with pre-k and everything like I know that but just for safety's sake I get that um, the problem is is that some of the classrooms are really 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 hot and that is becoming a dangerous part of this problem the other thing that this is like my personal brain tree playground faces the parking lot and there's no fence so for me, it's like really stressful to be putting all of this into play in the school while we're sweating, while literally you could just drive to the playground and there's no sort of barrier. Um, and I know that that's money and I know all these things, but it's just, Oh, no, it's not. You know, money is not an yeah. issue. It's, that's why we talk about this yeah. stuff, because that's not even on my radar until you said it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's I can just, put an offense for 800 bucks. So, yeah. <laughs> I will help you, Lane. I will bring my hammer. Yeah. Um, no, but it's just, one of, it's just one of those things. It's just like, 
the balance and the severity, it has to sort of be across the board. Um, yeah. So. Lane, does the, uh, do you or our uh, trustees or whoever the uh, board members are? Or, so to what extent are we looking at statistics? So, like if I was going to mandate uh, wearing seatbelts, uh, I might look how many people are getting killed and then do I not want those people to get killed and then go from that. And then yeah. I might say, look what happens when you don't wear a seatbelt and then and, and publicize that in order to get people to wear seatbelts. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, we see these terrible news stories and we hear these terrible things going on. And I'm just wondering, do you have any um, nuts and bolts? Yes, and I, I'm transparent and I can be blunt. Um, but the before I do that, recognize that the things that I may talk about happen in every district across the, across the state, probably more frequently than here. Um, in typically what happens, um, a lot of it's in middle school, high school level, is that whenever there is a shooting out in the world and the kids are hearing about it, they start to chatter. It, it, they start to think about it. Some students get nervous and they get worried. Other students are do stupid things and, and, and talk about it in ways that maybe, maybe I should do that. You'll have those comments. They're not really serious, but when you hear them, you take them extremely seriously. It is not unusual for us after a school shooting to have anywhere from three to five students that make comments that make people nervous enough that we go in and we do a full threat assessment. Mm -hmm. We've never had one that we've been worried about once the threat assessment is done, but we, but we don't joke around. Um, we had a situation last year where students were uh, trying to sell an assault rifle on school grounds. Um, we had a situation this year where a student forgot that it was there, and this is Vermont and hunting season and whatnot, um, forgot that the, the, the air rifle was in the back of the car. Mm -hmm. um, so we do respond to them. Um, it happens, I won't say with great frequency, that it tends to come in clusters. Um, but, but, you know, there, there are those things happening. And we are in Vermont. We are in one of the, the counties that has the highest per capita number of uh, firearms per person you know, in the country. Um, so you know, a lot, lot of the stuff in, in general that we deal with is, um, you know, it's the first cold day of fall, the kid grabs the warm jacket for the first time of the year to come to school in, forgot that he used it for turkey season and they're, you know, the, the cartridges are still in the pocket. Again, legitimate reasons the kid's not a threat, um, but again, we still have to deal with it and talk about it. So statistically, you know, if you look at it like that, how many of those do we deal with um, in a year? Um, I've seen years where 10 to 12. Um, last year, it was actually fairly quiet, um, probably two to three. Hmm. But yeah, we, we do deal with those. Do you have a personal opinion on whether it's more of a inconvenience and an expense than a genuine benefit? Um, I, uh, it, having said that, I actually like the idea of it because I'm a little anxious in our current political situation, things like That's that. That's one and of the reasons we're talking about it, okay. um, especially because we, you know, we've had some some politics close to home at some board meetings that, that made people a little bit nervous. Um, I don't have if if my, my if my personal rating scale, having having worked in other districts. Um, if it went from one to ten, with ten being most concerned, I'm probably right now sitting around the three to four um, in terms of concern. Um, and so, if that helps, trying to answer the question. So it's 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 fairly on the low. It's it's low but cautious. I guess is the best way to describe it. Is it an inconvenience that affects academics? Like you were talking about the delays. Lost, lost class time. Um, right. If, if, if they get, this is a large, as, as the, the, the principals have pointed out, this is a large building. It takes time if you go out the front door and walk around to the back and get on the back, back field and you could just walk out the back door right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, Devin Crowley from Brookfield. I forgot to introduce myself. But, so I, oh, I came from a, <laughs> what? Good to have you. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I came from a high school with a student body of 3,900. We had two entrances. We had two resource officers six or seven security staff that were multi-purpose roles within the school. 
no inconvenience. And I think the word inconvenience and student safety should not be in the same sentence. There should never be like, we're looking at, okay, our, our children's safety, like I gotta send her off and trusting that like nothing's gonna happen. Yeah. I don't care what inconvenience is in place. She needs to go there, she needs to learn, she needs to get on the bus, get back to me. So I think that the, the policy kind of coincides with the resource officer. Yeah. And that's a very important role. You know, I had a middle school, we had a resource officer. At a high school, we had two. They were not threats, they weren't intimidating, they bonded with the community, and it also gave students an idea of how to interact with them, and they also understood the students and how to interact with them. So I think that kind of goes hand in hand. Dumb question. Yeah. Uh, what is a resource officer? So there's there's two pieces. Let me let me write them down so I don't forget. We'll, sure. we'll talk on the resource officer. Is that another topic though? The resource. That's one something. Yeah, so that okay, then then we want to touch. I'll, on. I'll retract the question. I just like to piggyback on you. I, I don't know really how to say my feelings about how strong I feel about safety, and why would you ever compromise your students or your kids' safety? Um, at the elementary school, the PE teacher, I can maybe count a few times that she took the kids, even the previous teacher, I mean, go back 10 years, I've seen them take out the kids, I, I can count them on my hand, they, they don't take the kids out for PE, so maybe it's different here, but there's well, gyms well, co and they COVID, the expectation gym. was you're out in and out as much as you can. Sure, and that's not years. really the case anymore, so... Um, and I did first grade today, and we did. We had to walk all the way up the hall and all the way across the school and all the way down the stairs. And I were, we were out there for almost 15 minutes. I pushed it because it's beautiful weather. And um, not one bathroom break. I mean, I think it can be done. I think these things, at least in some situation, there might be some specific caveats that I'm not thinking of. But So are you, are you clear on... Are you on the side of uh, the one, one door or? Uh, yeah, or? and I, I really in the first week it was like, oh, we always used that door, and after school it was like 5:30. Thank goodness, I didn't break any rules. It was like open policy, but I went out a side door that I had gone out for. It was my classroom for five, six years. I went out that door, and I went out the door and I walked about here to the shelf and I went. You know, all those years that door always shut. It's slammed. It's a big heavy metal door, and I thought. Nope, I'll, I'll lose sleep tonight. And I went back and the door did not shut. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to bring that in, but if you want to know the ins and outs of what's working and not working over there, come talk to me, because it's, yeah. this is where I get shaky. It's infuriating how things are not functioning over there. And I've tried to talk to people who I think are the appropriate people to talk to. And some of it's just supply chain and some of it's, you know, I get that, but it, this was before COVID. There are doors that are supposed to lock that don't. There are key cards that are supposed to unlock that don't. There's buttons the kids push that lock the teacher out of the room. My key card doesn't work. Every teacher has their own little code. Well, if you, you scan it, then you go up twice, then down once, and then... It's like a secret handshake. There, nobody, the, the admin doesn't know. Nobody knows how to unlock the doors. So the, I mean, I think there's a reset, and then there's like a 10-minute reset. The, so then we're okay. So that's the latest I've heard is that there's a 10-minute reset. No, the the, the but door lock. We need to understand our. We have a security system that I don't think we even understand. I don't think it's functioning as properly as it should. And then we're talking about opening up other doors for convenience. So safety first and last. Yeah. So so a, a, a couple of good points. Um, the 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 principals in conjunction with. Um, the facilities director, or we talked about it today, they're supposed to be keeping a log, a, a monthly check of going around and pulling and making sure that the hardware is up to date, um, and that the doors are closing properly, because if the weather changes, doors can warp and things can happen, and so you want to keep an eye on that, and there's a reporting protocol that, that should be happening. The buttons um, that are there um, was an extra safety feature that at the time the staff had requested, and what those buttons do is they're on the inside of the door, so your door is locked um, and the door is shut, but the problem is is that people who have key cards that may give them access to your room can still get in. Pressing that button, what it does is it keeps anybody who has a key card that would have given them access, it shuts their cards off so they can't get in. Um, the question then becomes is it might be a talk with the staff is in terms of behavior management is why are the kids pushing the buttons? 
Maybe you can do it by accident. Even. Yeah, it's it's possible. It. It but those I mean, those are kids love to push the button. So and then the kids that know that it walks yeah. even love to push the button even more. But I'll, I'm, those are <laughs> topics that did come up as part of the conversation. Um, so happy to kind of pursue that as 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 we're going along. Right. And I don't want to point fingers because I know people here work as hard as they absolutely can, yeah. and it's not a fault of any particular person or it's like a number of things. But I'd love to see the the systems tighten up. And the doors are supposed to be, when they, the interior doors are supposed to close automatic. If they get, or if they're open, they're supposed to shut. So that if a, if a switch needed to be, um, you know, <laughs> if you needed a, a whole building locked down, all those doors should just all lock down. Um, and it's sort of a false sense of security because a lot of those doors don't. It was nice that Bob in the recent meeting said, one of the first things you do is you go over and pull that door. To make sure, but yeah, yeah we'll, t we'll yeah. It definitely it's in the conversation. I'm taking a couple of notes down to be able to follow up with it as well. Um, other other thoughts in terms of peace and the balance. Um, I'm a teacher here at the high school, and I agree. Like one door safety over convenience. I'm just not convinced that that's always putting safety over convenience. And like a good example of that is yesterday. There was a block in the high school schedule for about an hour and a half that everyone, middle and high, had advisory time, right? And it's 80 degrees out and it's sunny. And like, I went outside with my group of seventh graders. So it's me alone with 12 seventh graders. It's the end of the school day and we're walking through the high school parking lot, through the RTCC parking lot and outside, only to get outside for there had to be more than 50 students. And so, especially on the way back in where it's pickup time and there's buses and RTCC students who are driving their own cars or, and high school students right, are driving like high schoolers do and parents. And I don't think that the central doors, the main doors were any more safe than Katie or Lisa standing at the, the closest entrance to the back soccer fields where all of those students were to let students in through that door. Right, I don't think that that's the case the majority of the time, but when so many of the students, there had to be more than 50 kids out there, are walking through the parking lot in those circumstances, just to arrive at the front doors to have like the same security, right? Sorry, so I'm trying to be, I'm, security positions. I'm but trying to narrow in on the, the secure, security piece, it would be, be a little bit clearer for me. So is it the kids walking through the parking lot, the danger of the cars? Yes, is it the, okay. yeah, right only to just like be greeted at the front door to like yeah right like they would do the same thing at the back door but we would like avoid 50 kids running through the parking lot gotcha. when it's 80 mm -hmm. degrees and we've been back back door we set up like the front door we, like a buzz we, in kind of thing we talked about it especially up at brookfield uh, brookfield's in a weird situation where you know at least there's sidewalks around the building that the kids wouldn't have to necessarily walk through the parking lot here brookfield they have their main door and if that's the central door of that there's no sidewalks they enter right out in the parking lot there. and so we've been talking about potentially setting up the far door by the playground as as one of the monitor doors with the dozen of the camera so yeah there there, there are other possibilities lane i just i, I have to leave it but uh, one of the reasons yeah. i came to the meeting is I wanted to hear more about closing off the. Yeah. And and I just wanted to say, as a, a parent who drops off, picks up a kid who will now be driving very shortly, uh, coming from the Brookfield direction. Limited options, super congested in the morning and the in the afternoon. Um, to, in my mind, danger to kids and to, uh, to buses and everybody. I mean, there's so to shut that off completely to traffic. I, I'll throw this out there. If there's a genuine safety concern that couldn't be addressed by putting that mirror back up, and I say genuine, consider making it one way uh, because we don't have enough um, with that, uh, that horrible road, road out there that you'd have to jackknife to try to get. You know, yeah. if you're a good driver, you can't. You know, there's just it, it, there's too few options. Uh, that's I don't want to say that before. I have to so, leave. I'm sorry, to Oh, no problem. Let's um, <clears throat> let's do two things. My my, and this is where you correct me if I'm reading the room wrong. My general take on the discussion on the door policy is is err on the side of safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I have one thing to say about yeah. the door policy. Or two, I guess. Yep. One, the Brookfield School. So where the kids walk in, 
from the playground to the main door. Yeah. In the winter time, that's going to be like snow and ice falling down. It's that just throwing that out there. Does it slide off the roof? Yes. Oh, it, it okay. buries that. That's a great point. Yeah. It buries that area. The yeah, roof. that's something. Yeah, we, we, we've we got that problem at Central yeah. Office. They're actually looking at a solution. So I'm glad you bring it up because the solution they come up with, you can put out there as well. Yes. Then I'm a student at the tech center. I am in diversified ag, and we have to walk around the front office to go outside. So the other day we were cleaning out the shop, and we had to bring some gas cans and some other things out to the shed, like the pressure washer. Mm -hmm. So we had to carry all of that stuff to the main office and then walk around the outside of the building with it, just to get to the shed, which is like 100 yards from our doors. Yeah, the entrance, yeah. Yeah, and then is there any way that we can avoid doing that? And that's part it's of the forty-five minutes probably taken out of class time. Yeah, and that's that's a part of the the discussion about you know in general it feels like people want to err on the side of the side of um, safety, um, but there can be some like we're doing with the the preschool and whatnot if we have to. Do that just makes more sense. Technically, le legally, not only do we have to get them to the bathroom on time, we also have to get them to a bathroom that has uh, soap and water, I'm going to say. So uh, I'm writing it down just to take it into consideration as we're talking about it. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. So the switch gears a little bit here, and I do want to give some time for just open whatever people want to talk about. Um, let, let us do talk about the side road here because. Uh, there's been some different thinking as we've been kind of grappling with it a little bit. Um, so the, bit, the big concern over there is there are actually two blind corners. There's a blind corner um, because of where the cars are parked and you have to go around that first line of, of parked cars. Um, and there is a blind corner on the turn um, right by the Innovation Center. Um, we typically get probably about three accidents a year. Um, you, you guys had the kid on the bike last year that got hit. Um, a lot of it is the blind corner, a little bit too much of it is people just driving too darn fast. Um, the other idea that we have floated out there is, you know, we, we put in some 14 foot speed bumps so that only those that are brave enough and willing enough to risk their cars are going to use it. But at least it's available for the bigger vehicles if they, they need it, you know, like the fire, you know, the fire engines and whatnot. We did talk with the police, we talked with the town, we had a conversation um, with fire as well. They all seem to be on board if we want to change it. But as we've been talking about this, um, we kind of have the same concerns about what's it going to do with the traffic pattern on that four corner that has the sharp turn. Um, and I get a little bit wor worried about you know what the impact may be. Um, and so that's kind of the issue that we're dealing with. So kind of open up the floor to you know thoughts and ideas um, other than the ones that we've had. Um, we also had the idea of hey maybe we just we put the barriers out there for a month and, and, and see see what things look like, uh, and then make a decision after we've got some more data. So what, what do people think? What are they? So I'm wondering. So I'm in the innovation center. Right? Yeah, so it's so all your fault. I get here between uh, <laughs> six and seven most mornings, and so there's not a lot of traffic in the back parking lot yet, but there's, I often see people cutting through, I think, as a shortcut, yep. um, which I don't necessarily know is ideal. So I'm wondering if there could just be a gate that we open it when parents and family members need to bring their kids through, and then outside of those hours that they'd be moving through, we, shut, we can shut that gate. Um, that gives us control over that space. But I don't know if it still stop accidents or not, but. I just don't see it being used as a shortcut, I think, for people cutting across. Well, they, I think there's, there's legitimate, there's, there's people within the district. I use it all the time if I'm driving over to Randolph Elementary because it is hard to make that jackknife right. turn. And so I think we're getting a lot of street traffic that have nothing to do with the schools that use it for the same reason. Mm -hmm. And so it, technically it implies that the real solution is to fix the jackknife turn. Yeah. But that's not within our control. But I, I, I've got the idea of the gate down as yeah, a possibility. I've just noticed people driving through that yeah. don't seem to be parking anywhere in the school in the mornings. Yeah. No, they, I think they're using, they're avoiding that turn, and I can't blame them. Right. Mm -hmm. so, other thoughts? I like the idea of doing putting up a temporary barrier and just seeing what happens for a certain period of time, because then you can collect some more data on what actually is happening. 
and, and make a decision. Yeah, and the other thought is nobody likes change, and this is a fairly big one. Mm -hmm. um, but if we put up the temporary barrier for a month and a half and then see what people's attitude right. is afterwards, it might be extremely angry and, and, and violent at the end, which that gives us a pretty good indication of things, or, or, or they might kind of understand it. And it might stop some of that flow, right? If those yeah. people are just cutting through, if that's there, they're like, oh, I can't do yeah. that anymore. And Maybe you see a decrease. Yeah, and I, wor I also worry about whether the number of accidents in that four corner will go off. Mm -hmm. um, but that barrier. Other, th other thoughts in terms of trying to make a, a difficult decision on this? I think putting the mirror back up in a speed bump is a reasonable approach. I think if you close it or close it temporary, you should give the town a heads up to monitor the yep. Windover House. Uh, that intersection can already get pretty backed up. And if you're going to cut off one more avenue for everybody coming from that side of town, uh, that you might actually have to have that light be operating red, green, yellow, or something, because people are going to get stuck there. Yeah, that's a good point. I'd also be interested on accident data at the end of the Windover Road. Um, Typically, that can be an area where there have been some significant accidents, and if there will be increased traffic there, that I'm a worrier by nature, but that concerns me. No, I, I would not want to increase any, any risk at other places, that's for sure. So say that, and that's a good point. Other good thoughts and ideas? You guys have been full of good ones tonight. I appreciate that. I think what's tough about collecting data now is it's it's not the winter yet, and I think that data could change once it gets snowy and icy and there's more likelihood for accidents. Yeah, and I think people do come through that parking lot and as a way of getting around that hill that goes up to the three corners. Because mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> they come through and then go out. And they don't have to go up that that's so rotted and grooved. So, kind of to, to be honest, where where my personal leaning is right now um, is I think I, I think I'd like to do the temporary barrier for a little while just to see what happens. But I think my gut is telling me probably the potential best balance act here is is, is the mirror and the speed bumps. Um, what about the uh, traffic pattern, like you said, having a one way? Some um, sort of deterrence to, you know, at least it's an organized traffic pattern. Yeah, uh, we've actually talked about that in the past. It's not a bad thing. Um, we've actually also talked about, especially at the end of the day when the kids are leaving from the tech center and the, and here you've got the parent pickup going on at the same time that the buses are, are are trying to get in and out and weaving through those patterns there it can get a little sketchy at times. Um, was potentially buying one of the houses off on the front here to be able to level it and, and, and use it to change the traffic pattern. Um, so that's discussion that has been there as well. But yeah, the, the changing the traffic patterns is, is something that's been on the books, but we, we're going to follow through on it a little bit better. If it were one way, which, which way should it go based upon that corner up there? Because it's equally hard, I would imagine, to turn. It's probably easier to turn left than it is to turn right. So, turn right, okay. So they probably want the long way to go this way. You should go toward the main entrance. Yep. I think that, that was, personally, I think more people would be using that in the morning to get there on time and have more time to find the other side of the on. Gotcha. See if there's any other really critical ones before we just move into kind of open discussion. Oh, yeah, the fun one. The resource officer, I don't think we've touched on that yet. Yeah, resource officer, I, I want to bring bring it up um, just because we, we've touched on the door security piece. I had brought it up five years ago when I started um, because every district I've been in has always had a resource officer and they've always been an exceptional um, individual to have within the buildings. At the time, five years ago, it was probably one of the most ve vehemently rejected items I've ever discussed. Um, without, you know, people just did not want to have an armed individual in the building at the time. And so I'm wondering if that attitude has changed at this point in time. So when you say armed, what form of arms do you They are They are a police officer. 
Um, if they're here, um, usually a lot of the work is connecting with kids, getting a feel for kind of what's going on. You know, are they getting into stuff they shouldn't? What are ways that we can mentor them to keep them out of that trouble? Um, they typically work with us if a, a student comes in and, and does something within the building that breaks the law. Um, the job is not to get the kids, you know, into the court system so that they get a permanent record. It's to get them through a diversion so that they've got some logical consequences and they're hopefully kind of learning and growing from the experience. Um, they typically carry a sidearm. Um, they typically, what, what's the nice thing, and again, this is stuff you probably shouldn't know, um, but we keep a full uh, shooter response kit in the back of their car. That way they do. The that office. way, if, if, if something happens, they can put the vest on, they can be here immediately to try to, to deal with the situation as fast as possible because time is key in those situations. Um, but they also, they usually run the, the a, a, a D.A.R.E. program or the equivalent, um, so they'll teach out of the health class with the health teacher, um, those sorts of things. Is there any way they could carry like a like a taser versus a firearm, or like is there a degree to which they can uh, have the, a firearm lock somewhere, but where? It's they the probably device? could, but I think it would. And so I'm not saying. Oh, no, I'm asking. Like, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I don't know what the tr the training is in Vermont with them or what the accessibility is. So the school could actually buy one. Um, the the concern becomes. If one of the reasons for having them here is to potentially respond to a school shooter, um, they're going to need some fair firepower to handle the assault rifles that seem to be the weapon of choice. Um, yeah, they don't have time to unlock their weapon at a, an entry door where you grab have somebody grab it and go. Ran their truck into the tree or the car or the gate, yeah. gets out of the vehicle, is walking at a pace toward that front door. With a weapon, this like you can see it. Yeah. That that officer had, should have the time to engage that before that person ever makes it near that that door, yeah. or or at the very least while they're struggling to get in the main door because we've been Correct. following our lockdown procedures. Yeah, um, and that's the goal. So the sooner they have access to that, but again, the the, the other concern is just that is they, they've got to have firepower that's going to help them get through the bulletproof vest. The shooter's probably wearing as well as contend with the uh, assault rifle they're probably using. Um, and so yeah, they do need, usually, like I said, usually they carry a, they carry either a nine millimeter or a 45 um, handgun at all times, and then they have quick access to uh, more powerful weaponry in the car as well as their vest. So. A taser, yeah. uh, excuse me. Oh, uh, don't forget your thought. And we're going to come right back to you. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was just wondering what the students think about a resource officer. Um, this told? is the first time I'm, I'm bringing it up. Um, when I have the the focus group together to talk about the life skills, I'll definitely have the conversation with them. Because I, I think it would be yeah. pretty important to get a handle on how how students feel about it. Because there's 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 a mixed space out there around it. There is the the idea of is it you know having a cop in the school is a deterrent potentially or potentially can help save lives potentially although we've seen stories play out where that didn't make a difference but then there's also going to be a group of students who are going to be intimidated not feel safe or are going to don't trust the police do not feel that they will have their best interests at heart and and that creates a sense of again we keep talking about safety and psychological safety so so i think it'd be really really important to understand how the students feel about it um and then i as a, as an adult with a student in this school um i'd want to know if if a resource officer came in what's their de-escalation training how have they been trained in being able to work with students who represent other identities? Um, are they really um, capable of dealing with that nuance? Because I think that's critically important if, if this school decides to go in that direction. They, they go through a pretty comprehensive training that is specific to being a school resource officer. Um, 
again, there's, there's good and bad. I have only worked with exceptionally good ones. One of the, the biggest pieces where they are most helpful is because they know the kids pretty well. They know the families. Um, if I have a kid that we have to do a threat assessment on, on them, um, they know the families and the students well enough to say, yeah, this one, you know, you always take it seriously, but this one you need to take extra seriously, or this is one that, you know, you're still going to go through the process, but it's, it's doubtful that there's going to be a concern for so they can give us some pretty good information right up in front, just because of the connections that they have. But no, they're very, 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 um, very good salient points that, that I've got down to have that discussion about. And again, I'm not sold on doing it. This is about what, what, where is the community sitting with, you know, where the world is today. You know, has has the, the mentality changed about it? If it has, I'm more than happy to go through the budget process and, and work with um, work with you, Orange County Sheriff's Department, to try to find a suitable officer. If not, then we'll move it well. I think I can kind of piggyback on her comments about you know the correlation and the, between a school resource officer and student body. I, I think it kind of goes back to what I said about the home the home economics thing is it gives the police an opportunity to connect with the community that's rapidly changing and it can give the student body and a chance to kind of understand the law enforcement side of things. And I mean, I never. I never had a school resource officer that any other student body was like, oh, I hate him. You know, I, he's a pay. Now, it, it, at the end of the year, they were, you know, shaking hands, bumping fists, giving hugs, because it was like you just, you went through, you know, four years of high school with that person, or three years of middle school, and it was always a valuable thing. And it may, if you get the right person, it may, may de-escalate as they get to know them, some of those they build reasonable fears um, that people can have. So again, I'm not trying to sell it, but just um, I'm really just trying to to, to, to get an understanding of where people may be at. Other comments on, on resource officer? I'm not for it. Um, they could maybe possibly do a concealed carry, so the yeah. firearm's not visible. Wouldn't bother me either way. Let's do this just for fun. Uh, resource officer up. Think of, you think it's a good idea? Bad idea or? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Just to go to a read and keep them up for a second. Gotcha. I think um, some things, so I'm a student here, I'm a junior, um, and I'm also part of the racial justice uh, video. And something we were talking about is like the implications of having a police officer in the school and then having <coughs> students of color and what how they would feel about that. Um, earlier in the community forum, we were talking a lot about, you know, um, inclusivity and creating a safe space. And I would wonder, like, I think it would be very important to make sure students' opinions are heard about that, because that can could really contribute to not creating a safe space. Mm -hmm. Also, um, students who are on the neurodivergent spectrum or students with mental health issues, there have been so many different things that have shown very disconnect between like police forces and those groups of people that can then create an environment that may not make them feel safe. And so it might, might if I'm re reading you right, it might be good to, as we have kind of focus groups, or if we have focus group discussions about it, is, is that would be a very specific focus group, is calling the racial justice group and have a conversation with them to see where they're at and what they're thinking. Is that, is that kind of what you're? I think partially, but then also making sure that like, uh, also, students who are not part of the racial justice PPL, because it's a pretty small group, yeah. um, are, are still able to like be considered and heard, even if they're not a part of a group that's willing to like work with people and like speak out. What do the teachers think? Are they? What is their opinion about the idea of that? That's person? another discussion to have. We have a few here, but not enough to I would say to really represent. Tab is Tab still running around? would be good but that typically what I do with um, especially things if we're trying to make a decision on it I, I rotate through different groups and then try to con kind of consolidate what the, the piece is and if it's something that may be real controversial um, I'll put the survey out as well um, and so I'll, I'll keep folks informed of what I'm learning as we kind of go um, all right bigger issue and this one's more just I'm looking for a gut reaction um, on this one
So there, there are a couple of things that are converging in, in Vermont right now that might make it possible to replace this building and, and replace the RTCC and modernize. Um, one of them is the fact that in October, um, we will be up for the PCB testing. I don't know if folks are aware of that, but the legislature mandated that all schools must test. Um, the odds are is that it's a fair, a fair possibility that we are going to have some hits because of the age of the two schools that are going to test. It will be Brookfield and it will be this, this system here. Um, so that will put, if, if they come back with some positive testing and we've got to do some remediation, there's a, a, a ball in the bucket to say, hey, maybe it's just easier to replace the building. Um, the other thing that is going on was the state legislature sent out a study group last year to start taking a look at what is the, what is the status of, of buildings across the state. Are they in good condition or are they in poor condition? We need to have some information on this so that as a state legislature we can start to put some money aside to help provide matching funds for schools that need to renovate or need to be built. When they did that study, this building was put at the top of the list. Uh, now, a couple of caveats there. Um, the way that they did the study, it was really primarily based upon the age of the building with this idea that buildings have a useful lifespan, so our building is at the end of its useful lifespan. That said, you can keep the building going indefinitely if you do the right renovations and things along the way, which we've kind of done, but it is not a modern building by, by any means. So we were actually cited in the paper in that. So that gives us some political clout to be able to go after that, that money um, if it's there and if it's available. And our enrollments have been going up. Um, you know, Randolph, is, Randolph Elementary has either been a little stagnant or down, but all the other schools, the enrollments have been going up in the district for the past five years. Every now and then we'll have a year where it's level, but it goes up, it's level, it goes up, which is unusual in Vermont. So the thinking is, is that if we can get a substantial chunk of money from the state to help, um, is to rebuild this complex. Um, potentially separating the Tech Center building from this building. Um, we've got the athletic fields behind us. We could actually build on the, the fields out there while this building is still active and kids are coming in and taking their classes. And then after that, build, those new buildings are created. Uh, this building is shut down, wiped off the map, and we build the athletic fields out in front of the school. It brings up two other possibilities um, that are high in the sky, but there's some good reasons to consider them. We are in the process over the last five years of creating a, a pretty powerhouse STEM program um, within the building. We brought in the robotics, we brought in the coatings, we've got the competitions that are going on. I've invested about 450,000 in those programs over the last three years. We would like to build a STEM academy. That itself could be a separate building um, so that it's K to 12, so that the students across the district could visit it and use it. It could be a year-round building that we also create into kind of a museum so that we get visitors from other schools that want to come in and you know maybe spend a week of activities with us and, and we can charge for, for that and also put in an educational conference room because we're central in the state and rent that out for people that want to come in and um, use the space, especially as it relates to STEM and science. Because if we're doing a good job and we're a model, people can learn from us. The other pie-in-the-sky item has to do with athletics. At the very least, if those athletic fields are rebuilt on this spot, it would be nice to have lights out there. Um, a higher vision is if we're going to be spending 50 to 150 million on a new building, why not spend the extra 1.6 million and put in a turf field? Mm -hmm. We are central in the state of Vermont which makes it easy for everybody within reason to get to us. We could be the site for all the tournaments that happen um, for state sports in the state if we built the complex that would house it. And so those are kind of the ideas that are out there. Um, they're kind of discussed on and off um, at this point in time. But now that I've said those things, what's a gut reaction that people have? You know, no, no freaking way because it's going to be taxes, excuse the language. Um, might be a good idea depending upon or, or, or this is something we really should investigate deeply. Unfortunately, I'm 
for it. Yeah. 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 I think it's something that deserves, that's worth looking into. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any idea of how much it would cost if we did have to potentially rebuild or fix the issues in this building? I uh, mean renovate as opposed to rebuild? Yes. Um, it's typically more expensive to renovate than it is to rebuild. Okay. Um, for a lot of reasons and then you, you typically end up with problems. Um, like we could, we talked about, some people had some good ideas about the STEM Academy is, you know, we build a second floor here. Um, what ends up happening is you get un, unbalancing issues with HVAC. Mm -hmm. Whenever you build new on to old, you can never balance the heat, the air conditioning and whatnot. The other thing that will allow us to do um, at the same time, again, pie in the sky, you know, as we bring in the solar panels and we put air conditioning in the building so that we don't have to deal with the humidity and the potential mold and everything else that we've dealt with in the past couple of years. Um, and there are some grants out there to do that. We're actually putting in, um, we've applied for grants to put in full air conditioning in the two small elementary schools just to deal with the mold problems. Um, plus to make it comfortable for people that, you know, we can have mold problems there at times. So if I can, having been at the tech center, I'll speak to that first um, for so long. I think as the needs of the community grow and as um, technology changes, the auto shop is going to need, need major renovations as we go fully electric. Um, same with diesel. Um, we know that health careers is a big draw in that program, um, the program down there. That program could be doubled if there was a size. Um, so as a draw from, we think Northfield, Williamstown, Rochester, um, White River Valley, Chelsea, all these sending towns, if there were more options there, uh, I think more students would come there. Um, but also we need to have those programs continue to be competitive and, and provide the education that they're going to go out and need to be successful in the community, right? So that we know that they're not going to be turning wrenches on gasoline diesel engines for much longer, much right? Longer. So are we providing students an education that's actually going to be useful yeah. when they leave here? So I think there's going to need to be major upgrades on that end of the building um, looking in the future, but also, some, I mean, now I'm in an innovation center, I would love to see more energy going to STEM. Um, I think that would also be a draw so to bring students into our district from sending regions. Now that we want to try to steal people, but I think, no, you, know, you look at Rochester, we, we like, where, where's it going to go? Right? And we want to steal them because we're doing a better job right. than other people can. Right. Yeah. And so I think, you know, look at Rochester, like, if they look at us as a more attractive option because we have better educational outcomes and opportunities. In Chelsea, some of these school places that don't have schools anymore, um, and then people who are moving into the region, like, oh, I want to go there. My kids has this, all these great academic opportunities, and all that's built off of in infrastructure. Yeah. We can't offer health careers if we have one room, yeah. right? And there's definitely the capacity. So the 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 semi vision that's out there on the the tech center, and, and actually started with Felicia, and then we added some things to it is you know get the building trades in its own building by itself um, we've got to bring in a, a plumbing hvac program and then we've got all the building trades uh, in one place and then we want to go back if possible because this will help out the community as a whole where we have money that is set aside it's been sitting in an account probably for 30 years to be able to literally go out and buy houses that are fixer uppers fix them up um, and then sell them back. Um, and why that's important is one of the reasons that people don't move to this region is because the housing stock is old. And the housing stock, if you buy a house here, you know, you're, you're gonna turn around and put another 200, 300,000 into it to get it up to, up to snuff so that it's moving ready. And so if we can get a process like that going, we're not only serving the kids in the tech center, but we're also providing a valuable service to the town because the increasing enrollments and growth is how schools survive in Vermont right now. Um, we've had enrollment increases, um, but if we can do some amazing things, you know, it would not be unlikely to be able to have a, kid, a, a, a high school with 1,600 kids at some point in the future. If I get one more little sliver of a, so while I was at the tech center, I tried to get CCV to come in, because our students who had to go to either Montpelier or down to White River Junction to take courses. And so I offer them, like, why don't you come in and use us as a satellite campus? Not that you offer yeah. everything, but offer one or two or three courses that are in high demand. Um, 
but the facilities wouldn't support yeah. what they well, want to do. So if we had the space for them, if we, had the, if building, we had the STEM center with the museum and the conference room. Right. We've got the space so then, that sort of work. You know, that offers our students more post-secondary opportunities because you know transportation is a problem, or if you have a young family trying to figure out childcare because and make this 45 minute commute. Right. I think that would, would offer opportunities beyond just the yeah. techs in high school. We could offer more opportunities for the whole community. Yeah. And so there, there's possibilities, but again, it's, it's initial thoughts, and the reason that the thoughts are coming up um, is because, like I said, we've got those those issues that are happening that are coming together to make it look like, you know what, you know, if there's PC, if there's PCB issues, if there's, um, then we're going to have to do major renovation because of that anyway, and if the state is actually going to put some money in a bucket for people to access, and if we're high on the list, then maybe we should just go after it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Uh, would you all consider a running track for the track That would be field? a part of it, the rub core track. We can't even hold there. meets here, whole yeah. meets, you know? Yeah, we don't have a cinder track, which... So you're, you're there. on that... Yeah, that that's the right. that's the pipe dream is is in addition yeah. to all this as we become the, the the central place for for tournaments in Vermont. We have a, a literal astroturf field with the lights, with the stadium, and the stands, yeah. um, and you know surrounded by the record track. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. And I, the the cost of that, I, I built one at Marblehead. I'm sure it's changed since then. It's about one one point six million. But again, if you're building a hundred and fifty million dollar school, yeah. At that point in time, what's another 1.6? Especially if it may be bringing in money. Uh, Marblehead, um, you know, you, you, we had a fence around it. You charge people access to those terminals. You, you know, it was a $12 ticket. We, we, we make 15000 in a night um, to help you know, keep and maintain the, maintain, maintain the turf. Okay. So, Would that be the type of thing, Lane, though, that like community could have access? And walk and they are great. Yeah. You can use them yeah. rain or shine yes, because of the drainage, yeah. um, and it's open to everybody yeah. when there's awesome. not needs going on. Mm -hmm. And the lights, you, you keep the lights on in the evening as long as it's not upsetting the neighbors. You know, that's the one of the things you got to consider with the lights is they're not shining in the neighbor's yard and keeping them up. Right. Um, that would do a lot for just active. Yeah. Um, yeah so well, let's do a couple of things here. Just again, a thumbs up, thumbs down. Worth worth looking at or. Too high in the sky, let's not waste yeah. our time on it. Look at it yeah. All right, that one's fairly unanimous. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't even have to write that down. So just All right, th at this point in time, I've, I've got the info from folks that, that, that I need that's going to be helpful to me and the, the committees that I, I work with. Um, but I always, always leave things open that if there are things that are on people's minds um, or things that they people just want to talk about, this is the time. Again, just be aware that I'm, I'm typically pretty blunt. I'm very transparent about things. Um, you may not hear what you want to hear, but it'll, it'll be honest and it'll be logical. Um, so I don't know if there's any topics that both people want to broach. You guys are making life too easy. <laughs> Plus it's late, I get that. All right, I, I appreciate the time tonight. Um, and again, what I will do is I will piggyback on the, um, the third Thursday of every month with the uh, RUHS. Um, typically, if, if there's not a lot going on in the district, I actually try to come, come to their meeting for most of it as well, um, just to participate. So, good. All right. Awesome. Thank you. The only scary part is, what is it? It's 8.30 and it's dark? That wasn't the case a month ago.